Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled, I don't care about your business requirements. My name's Charmaine and I'm a part of the IABA Melbourne branch as the events lead and I'll be your host this evening. I'm excited for today's presentation where our speakers Dan Warby and Paul Francis discuss the, dis the perspective from a BA to the sponsor or business users. But before we get started, I'll just go through some general housekeeping and answer some frequently asked questions. But first, an acknowledgement of country. IABA Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, borders and culture. We pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present with us today. Now, as this is a webinar, you'll be able to submit questions for the presenter to answer. So please, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box and use Zoom control panel. And all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you do have any technical support problems, please type a message in the question box as well, and we'll attend to any technical problems if they arise. And also just to let everybody know, this webinar is recorded and will be emailed to you uh, with a copy in the, in the next coming days. And I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speakers, uh, Dan Warby. Say hello, Hi, Dan. Guys. <laughs> Hi. And Dan works with leading Australian organisations, providing them in, with incisive insight in developing superior experiences and value propositions for their brands, products and services. With more than 20 years of global and local experience in the field, Dan combines his deep knowledge and easygoing style to give you exceptional advice to drive sustainable and continuously improving experience programs that work for everybody from exec teams to frontline staff. And Paul, evening Paul, say hello. <laughs> Uh, now, Paul is an experienced principal consultant with 30 years of experience across a broad range of industries, including mining, manufacturing, retail, transport, information media, and telecommunications. He can rapidly adjust to new business environments, having worked in a wide range of functions, including business unit management, organizational design, product management, change management, data modeling, business analysis, technical support, and training. Now, IABA Melbourne brings you an online event featuring speakers, Dan and Paul, discussing the perspective from a BA to the sponsor and business users. The focus of this conversation will be on how we can utilize some CX techniques to elicit requirements and how they're more valid than the BA sitting there and just taking orders. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Dan and Paul. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Um, Paul, do you want to take I'll it away? I'm sharing my screen. You're on mute, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, so we do actually care about user requirements or, or uh, requirements uh, in general, but we don't actually want to fall into the trap of just taking uh, key users' requirements without analysing and challenging them. I, I suppose that what we're going to talk about tonight is ways to challenge you know, requirements and needs and actually uh, be able to prioritise those uh, needs as well. So, you know, we, we want to look, look at pain points, what people like about things. Uh, we, we don't want to just reskin um, existing problems with a new you know, interface because that doesn't solve anything. It costs a lot of money, uh, but, but there's no real benefit to the business. Uh, so I think the, the, the gist of this session tonight is concentrate a lot more on the analysis than uh, just writing down verbatim what, what a user might give you. Uh, and as Yulia Kosarenko says, uh, requirements don't come from the business, they come from business analysis. So Paul, I'm just sharing my screen. Do you want to talk to the, to the uh, pack? Yeah, uh, sounds good. Um, so this one, I suppose, is yeah. How often do clients read all the requirements that we write? So uh, 
you know, I've in the past written huge business requirements documents. Uh, I had to have walkthrough sessions with users to read them, etc. So just throwing it out to people, how often do people read all your requirements? Uh, yeah, all the time, half the time. What, what, what do people think? Just, just yell out if you like. I'll probably say 30%. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. If you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. Could be even smaller if you're, if you're, if you're not lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It's like it takes a lot of effort and time to, to generate those requirements. And if they're not read, they're, they're um, pretty useless. So, uh, and that, yeah, what ends up happening is you end up uh, building that, you know, something that people don't want or need um, or like, for that matter. Uh, I was a uh, a company that uh, was on version six or something as far as development was going, but they were actually version three uh, because the users refused to, to migrate to the newer versions because it just didn't do what they, they needed it to do. So, uh, and that's really just a case of uh, people ignoring the, the requirements that get written and, and just signing them off and expecting it all be okay, which I think most people on this call have experienced that that's not always the way it works. So. Uh, and there's reading and then on understanding. <laughs> exactly. <different> <laughs> and, and typically in the past, uh, requirements are very, um, you know, it's, it concentrates on written form rather than um, visual forms. And 60 or 70% of people um, absorb information better from a visual point of view than a written form, uh, especially you know, if English is not their first language as well. Uh, so, so there's various aspects that, you know, being able to read the requirements, understand them and, and determine what they mean uh, can take a fair bit of effort when, when you stick to that traditional model of writing requirements and then getting them, getting them reviewed and signed off. So that's really what this session's all about. Can we go to the next slide, Dan? Sure. So just a few stats. So uh, about 70% of projects fail or run late or over budget. Uh, uh, yeah, um, if looking at this pie chart, as you can see, you know, out of features that get developed, 50% uh, are hardly ever or never used and 30% um, are seldom used. So you're left with 20% of what you've written requirements for being the thing that gets used most quite often. So that's a lot of wasted effort development-wise, um, BA-wise, uh, and yeah, obviously that's money to the company or, or organisation that, that's um, trying to make the change. And it gets worse for things like package applications where only 5% of features and functions get used. Uh, so just something to be, you know, sort of to bear in mind when, when you are developing things is, is it actually ever going to be used? Um, next slide, Dan. Sure. So Dan, do you want to talk to this one? Sure. So I, I guess the, um, you might be wondering, so Charmaine did a beautiful job of introducing us and um, you might have seen from my title that I'm the practice director for design and you're thinking, what the hell is a design guy doing on a BA um, meeting? But uh, in our organisation, we include uh, business analysis as part of design along with customer experience and user experience. So uh, we think very highly of our BAs, but we also think there's a great opportunity to combine BA skills with human-centered design approaches to uh, developing requirements or other activities that a BA might do. And we really feel that um, in that scenario, um, you do get better solutions that are um, worked out for um, uh, the clients that we deal with. So um, uh, the other thing I'd say about myself, sorry, I don't want to, I, I, it might seem a bit self-serving to talk about myself, but but um, you know, I um, in Charmaine's introduction, she talked about um, uh, my longevity. But I did actually start as a BA, 
So I know what it's like to write business requirements. And over the years, I gravitated from writing business requirements and, um, and doing you know, functional design specifications and things like that through to doing change integration and then being head of customer experience at different organizations. Some of them um, where you get given a blank sheet of paper and you have to um, work out what the strategy is and the approach. Others, it's about maturing existing ones. Uh, but I think um, over my career, what I've learned is that um, combining experiences from different roles and different functions is often a really good way uh, to actually um, develop out better answers to questions. So the three things we really want to focus on in this uh, presentation are looking at requirements from a holistic point of view, um, looking at um, the power of research when you create requirements for uh, uh, clients or organizations and using user testing as well. So um, maybe what I'll do is, uh, I won't labor this page, but I'll sort of go through and talk about each of them in turn. So if we, if we think about holistic um, design, first of all, um, a lot of it is about considering the bigger picture. So if I, if I click to this page, um, you know, where you can see what we've got here, but um, just to give you a little bit of an anecdote. So someone told me once that um, in the um, Second World War, uh, when bombers used to return from uh, sorties that they would fly, um, the equivalent of what you would call business analysts at the time uh, would look at the fuselages of the bombers that returned, uh, assessing the bullet holes um, uh, with the task to actually um, come up with a solution or design a solution that actually uh, strengthened the fuselage of planes. Uh, so, uh, you know, more of them would return. And um, so they, they went down that approach until some bright spark said, hey, hang on a second. We're looking at the planes that are returning from the sorties. What about the, the damage that was incurred on the planes that didn't return uh, from um, the bombing flight? So um, the reason I bring that up is it's you've got to think about uh, problems from a holistic point of view and actually think about requirements that solve the actual problems, not the ones that you might consider if you look at it from a two dimensional uh, perspective. The second thing that, that um, we talked about there was about research. So um, there's many different ways to look at it, um, and we'll give you more specific examples as we go through um, the presentation tonight. But what I think it often comes down to uh, when you do research, it all depends on when you do the research, is understanding what do users or customers or clients, whoever you're dealing with, what do they really want or need from the solution that you're developing? Um, now, I'm pretty sure um, this, is an, uh, this is a myth. I was going to say an urban myth, but it's just a myth, I think, that um, the, uh, the NASA, the American Space Agency, um, when they were running regular um, space programs um, in, the, in the late 60s and 70s, uh, were tasked with actually developing a pen that would write for astronauts when they were in space. Um, you know, which sounds great and all the rest of it, but I mean, what was the actual need that needed to be fulfilled there? So the actual need was, was to be able to actually write something down in space. Uh, so if you, can bear, if you compare the NASA to the Soviet space program, um, the Soviet cosmonauts, they just used pencils. So they were still able to um, write in space and not be concerned with uh, zero gravity in the process. And so again, you know, as I said, it's probably a myth, but I think the, uh, the, uh, the focus here is about really understanding what the need is before you go down the path of you know, writing 200 requirements for a system when really um, the, the main features um, that you need to focus on may be lost in the process. Now, Paul, you had an example as well that you wanted to, um, to bring up. Yeah, so um, uh, I was involved in uh, developing an app for um, boat users. And we went away, did research, et cetera, developed the UI, uh, and it looked very nice in the office. Um, but out on the water, um, the color combination made this, the mobile phone screen look like a mirror. 
So it was back to the drawing board to actually work out color combinations that uh, were legible uh, out on the water. People were often using uh, sunglasses, et cetera, to, to see their screens and so on. So uh, what, what looks fine in, in sort of an office situation, um, talking to business people is quite different to being out with the users uh, in, in real world situation. Uh, another, another situation was um, a betting app where, um, you know, the, the design was based around using two hands to to, to make, you know, sort of uh, adjustments to bets, et cetera. But it didn't allow for the fact that most of the bets being placed on the, on the mobile phone was using the phone in one hand and having a drink or, or something to eat in the other hand. So they, they need to be able to place or cancel bets uh, single-handed, not two-handed. Uh, so that obviously changes the, the menu structure and the UI uh, of the app as well. <laughs> There's just a couple of examples um, in the last few years. Did, did any of the students want to share uh, examples that they've come across where you've, you, you're, you're targeting the, the, um, the uh, the wrong need or a, or a user testing experience has, has thrown up some issues for you? No, okay, well, let's, we can we can come back to that of the Q and A's at the end. Yeah, I, th I think that's the part of the thing too, is that I think, yeah, in the past business analysis, the very much, um, you know, a, a linear process where you go um, gather the requirements, um, get them reviewed by stakeholders and sign them off and then development and testing starts. Whereas I think what we're proposing is a lot more iterative approach where feedback from users then informs the next uh, lot of research and analysis to do to, to improve the, the application. Yeah. Cool, okay, let's, let's uh, move on. So I, I guess, you know, you might be thinking this is all well and good, but um, how do we apply it in a in a live environment in a live situation? And um, uh, you know, one thing I always think about um, in terms of a BA role is that there are you may not even think you're doing it, but there are plenty of times when you use human centered design techniques um, uh, and uh, think laterally to actually get better business requirements. So what we wanted to do is give you some examples where. Um, you can actually do this and uh, some practical examples. So here's just a few that uh, from recent work that, that I've done or, or we've done with clients um, that apply certain techniques that actually um, will inform the, the, um, the requirement writing process or the BA process. Uh, so uh, recently, uh, one of our clients was GPC. You may be familiar with those guys. They, they work in the auto parts industry. Um, they approached this because they wanted to develop uh, a loyalty uh, management platform uh, for their customers, um, you know, for all the reasons that you would want to do a loyalty program. So you'd want to um, ensure repeat business. You might want to grow um, or increase the average transaction value uh, that you have for your clients. So these are all really valid reasons. And, and many of the of the organizations that introduce loyalty programs are trying to drive the same outcomes. Um, the reality was that um, when they approached us to do it, uh, we were simply asked to write the business requirements. Uh, but as you, you probably well know that as soon as you um, enter an engagement, you find out that things are not exactly as you might have imagined they would be uh, when you start. So you sort of have to uh, understand what's going on uh, within the organization and um, it's almost like you need a completely brand new BA approach almost every time you uh, uh, engage a new client. But in this situation, what we realized is that they'd, you know, they'd have put some thought into it, but really they didn't have um, an idea about the business requirements and they weren't nailed basically to, um, uh, to be able to put in front of a, a solution developer. So uh, again, you know, you could sort of work with them and sort of order take requirements or you could think about it a little bit more laterally. So that's the approach that we decided to take. So um, the first exercise really was to is to uh, do what I would call defining the guardrails. So um, in this situation, in a loyalty program, um, you, you want to really understand 
the parameters in which you're working with before you can kind of progress and, and narrow things down. So uh, in terms of loyalty, it might be looking at, okay, well, do you want a loyalty program that offers discounts to loyal customers? Or do you want to go down uh, the line, which is about offering uh, points to uh, loyal customers that they can then redeem later? You know, do you want to uh, give people an advancement? So if you, if you decide you want to go down um, the discount path or the points path, do you want to offer um, potential loyal customers uh, an advancement to engage with the program? So do you want to, um, you know, give them, you know, uh, you know, five, five dollars that they can apply as a discount? Or do you want to give them 100 points to begin with? So, so in order to narrow down and work on these requirements, we, we went through this process of, of um, defining the guardrails. The next step that we went through is we realized that um, they hadn't, as an organization, engaged with um, the uh, loyal customers that they wanted to appeal to in terms of understanding what they would want from a loyalty program. So the next step in the process was to actually um, approach the high value segments within um, you know, their, their um, you know, um, uh, customer engagement um, system um, and talk to them about what, are they, what, are, what would they actually want from a loyalty program. Um, and in that process, we were able to give them different types of experiences they might get from a loyalty program and different kind of features, different kinds of features that they might actually want to use or would want, uh, would encourage them to engage with the system. So it might be um, using um, the system on a, on a phone-based app on an Android phone or an iOS phone, uh, or would they wouldn't do it in a, on a website? Would they want to uh, be able to use it at events? Would they want to use it to um, redeem, you know, money can't buy experiences, or would they want it uh, to be a more practical type of program? So, the the point of going through the interview process was to very quickly understand, you know, what things would be appealing uh, to the target audience that they were going for. Uh, having done all that, actually made the requirement writing process much, much easier and much more targeted to the actual system. So we were able to uh, rapidly, uh, having gone a little bit slow at the beginning, we were able to quite quickly write business requirements that we could then put in front of different vendors in order to be able to select the right vendor and then develop the system. So, so it's about using some of those HCDs early in the program to get to a good BA outcome. The second example, which is more focused, you know, again, they're all a little bit um, researchy. And I, and I think there's, um, it, you know, it tells you how to quickly add value from a BA point of view, if you ask me. But the second example is one that we used recently with Melbourne Water. Some of you, you know, um, Melbourne Water is a, is, um, um, a government um, body. Uh, it's not a retailer. It's water to the whole of the Melbourne area and to um, retailers and to developers and things like that. But um, they'd gone down the path, that, um, which is similar to many organizations, I think, where they really want to digitalize their content and um, you know, be more visible and accountable to uh, people across the Melbourne area. So they really had this desire to um, uh, uh, demonstrate all the, their content um, to, um, uh, to uh, customer facing people in a digital way. Um, the challenge around it was that they hadn't actually applied um, governance at the strut. So um, everyone had kind of taken on the, the mantle of, of sharing content, but it hadn't been structured. So they really wanted uh, us to help them write requirements around uh, a digital uh, governance program that they wanted to apply. Uh, again, all well and good and very well intentioned. Um, but before we went down the path of writing the requirements for um, a digital strategy and, and digital governance, I felt it was really important to understand from uh, the user point of view, so the employee user point of view, what was actually um, required in this particular um, situation and then narrow it down into recommendations that could then be applied more practically. So 
uh, we did an exercise where we spoke to many, many uh, users within the Melbourne Water uh, environment across different functions uh, and different um, areas within the organization to understand what they would want from a, a, a digital governance program. Uh, once we were able to do that, uh, we could then actually narrow it down into some uh, sort of prioritized recommendations and then work proactively with Melbourne Water to co-design a, a solution for their problem and write rec uh, requirements um, uh, that they could apply now and then out into the future. So it was about getting governance happening quickly um, and in a sensible way, and then adding more complexity later. So again, it's about taking that, that sort of BA role, but applying different techniques to get to a really good outcome for them really quickly. I guess the, the last one I, I wanted to uh, put in front of you guys tonight is about the value of user testing um, and uh, to be able to solve the right problem um, and apply the right design by um, through the a kind of BA process. Uh, so again, we, we worked with um, the Department of, of Environment, Land, uh, Waters and Planning, um, and they were looking specifically at um, uh, overhauling their um, case management apps and their occupational health and safety um, um, uh, app, which they use in their organization. So uh, many organizations have uh, occup occupational health and safety. I guess the challenge with DELP um, is that it needed to apply to kind of business uh, environment and um, uh, they do a lot of research and things as well. But uh, within the DELP camp, uh, you have forest fire and rescue. Uh, so uh, if you don't know already, um, the uh, forest fire and rescue, they are the part of uh, the DELP organization that manage um, fires uh, and the, the fire risk. Uh, so as you can imagine, you know, falling, falling down the stairs in an office is one thing. Um, uh, having your um, ute tip over in a fire environment, uh, you know, when you're surrounded by flames on three sides is quite a different thing. So it was really about understanding uh, not just how people in a, an office environment might use an occupational health and safety app, but how people would use it in the field. Um, so going through the process of, um, of interviewing users across the environment was a really valuable one. And one of the other things that, that we did in the process was we didn't want to overspec uh, the design process. So one of the ways that we managed to corral thinking was to use what I would call projective technique or projective analysis. So uh, what that means is giving people the opportunity to think about what you're asking them and projecting it onto something else or a different situation. So it might be asking them, you know, if this occupational health and safety app was an animal, what kind of animal would it be? Um, uh, and they might describe it as um, the, the current app as a, you know, uh, you know, a wombat, you know, it might be tough in certain environments, but um, you can't use it in the daylight or something like that. So um, it's, it gives people a chance to articulate the, um, the problem that you're trying to address uh, in a way that sort of takes um, the, the emotionally charged element out of it. So um, there's always environments, I think, in, um, right, in understanding requirements and, and um, developing so solutions where projective techniques work really well. So once we did that, we were able to set up a situation where we could write and use user tests for them. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about um, DELP is once you, once you put things in front of people, they're, they're able to give us really practical advice. So um, when we were thinking about this app, it was more about, um, you know, uh, when, when it came down to the criteria that you needed to be prioritizing, it was about connectivity in the field. So, you know, it's about, you know, uh, coverage uh, when you're in a remote area. Uh, it was also about also about the simplicity of the input. So uh, I guess if you're if you involve um, you know risk management people, risk and safety people in the development of an occupational health and safety app, they want they might want many different uh, fields that and uh, to get users to enter into. 
But if you're in a in a remote area and you're trying to enter it into a into a, you maybe only want to enter five things. Uh, so it's about understanding really in in very small detail what was really important. The other thing that came out of it in terms of criteria prioritization was that in in a fire situation you might be from a a country fire authority in Sarsfield, for instance, but you might be fighting a fire in Glen Maggie, uh, which is in a different region within Victoria. Uh, so your normal um, line management role uh, or line manager might be based in Sarsfield, but you're uh, on site in Glen Maggie. And um, if you enter a, a situation and you want and you need it to be remediated, you want it to go to the line manager in Glen Maggie and not in, in Sarsfield because the Sarsfield person can't do anything for you. So again, going through this process of understanding really uh, what a system needs to be used for, how it would work in practice, and then working with users to prioritize it helps you to actually narrow down and write the right type of requirements. So you right size your solution and, and you go from there. So again, you know, we, we didn't want to bombard you with loads of different scenarios but I just wanted to give you the flavor of a few different ways you could use human-centered design techniques to write better requirements basically uh, so maybe back to you um Paul okay yeah so so I think you know the, probably the three takeaways I think are sort of be curious be experiential and be collaborative so they're pretty much attributes of most BAs anyway so um yeah, be curious um dig further than you you, you know the, maybe the, the main stakeholder might expect you to um look at it from different users point of view uh and, and drill, drill down on that um and be collaborative so I think the days of a BA writing requirements and when they're finished uh, getting them signed off and handing them over to um, a solution design team or developing development team and then saying, you know, I've finished now, uh, I've probably gone. I think you need to be a lot more collaborative and work closer with testers, devs, and even the end users to actually walk through designs, walk through um, the app as it's being developed to make sure that it's heading the right direction and then take feedback and incorporate that into future uh changes to the app or or the uh or what you're building uh use research to um bolster your case for value for the end customer so uh yeah there's been times where i've been on projects where they haven't worked out been able to work out which group of customers or, or users takes precedence over another so do they need to build two applications do they need to make it more configurable so being able to use research techniques and and go away and work out the value of different types of customer to the organization that helps as well so um that that then drives yeah possibly what gets developed uh and there's techniques ba standard techniques can be used so that you know the five wise type thing um you know, brainstorming mind maps those sorts of things they're all sort of in the ba um, toolkit that you can pull out and use to help uh, dig further into the, what what's needed, but rather than what somebody says that they want, don't just listen to the, the noisiest stakeholder and take what he says or he she says as gospel. Um, do some more digging uh, is really what the, the second one is, and then the, the third one is, yeah, borrow uh, ACD techniques. Uh, yeah, I've. I've sat in on interview sessions run by HCD team members, and it's a lot more formal than what BAs used to do. So I think that, that formality of interviews, and recording the results, and being able to play that back to other stakeholders is a, a really good technique to actually borrow from a BA point of view. Um, you know, customer journeys, um, user journeys, those sorts of things, um, CX techniques, they're all really useful to, have, to to be able to to add to your uh, list of techniques that you use to to dr drill down on uh, what the need real need is. Uh, 
and try a more visual approach. I think, you know, writing BRDs or even user stories for that matter with acceptance criteria, it's really hard for um, business users to understand it. And then, you know, even if, even things like use cases or um, you know, process maps, some users have, have, a trouble, have trouble understanding those. So <coughs> try different forms of visualization to, to get things across to, to users and, and get an understanding of where they're coming from. Uh, and that's probably about it I think, for that slide, Dan. Okay, cool. Oh, sorry, I clicked yeah. too far. So, so what questions do you guys have? Far, far away. Hi, um, I had a question. My name is Charlena. Um, just wanted to ask with regards Oh, sorry, we, we that, lost you, something odd is happening with my device. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, just with regards to interviewing, um, you, know, you mentioned in, in some of the scenarios, um, interviewing employees to, I guess, um, get a better idea of what you actually wanted or what they needed, sorry. Do you have any um, suggestions about resources or places to help? improve those interviewing type skills. I I did a bunch of, I guess, focus groups recently um, with regards to an intranet site that we're building. Um, and I kind of, you know, looked at looked a couple of things up, thought I had some good questions, but I know that's an area I definitely like to improve in um, with regards to actually interviewing. Um, do you have any suggestions or ways to improve those skills or resources I could look at? Yeah, so so I think um, like if, if you're, um... Uh, so, Sh Charlena, are you a are you a BA? Um, uh, yes, I am. Yeah, in terms yeah. of um, yeah, I am. Yeah, so yeah. new to the new to the BA sort of role in land, though I guess. Yeah, well, I think I think um, I mean I could probably bamboozle you with some complicated ways to do it, but um, I think understanding the, the, the there's a few things that I always try and get out of it. So one of them is to you know if you if it's if it works well i would i would definitely use some projective techniques that i've mentioned before you know if this was a if this was a certain situation um you know uh, uh project it onto something else so you know if this if this system if this intranet site was a uh was a an animal or a car uh, what would it be people are incredibly articulate when you can direct them to something else um if you ask them directly about it they they often can't answer you, uh, so I would use that as a as a bit of a um, as a as a format for for understanding really what's going on underneath the bonnet. You know, um, the other thing that I would do is um, again it's, it's harder in a focus group, but you really want to get to the bottom of uh, the need that you're trying to address, um, and um, the challenge around that is there are conscious needs. Uh, and there are unconscious needs. Uh, so um, what I would always, you know, again, it's, it's it, the circumstances um, can often be challenging, but people will give you their conscious needs very quickly. It's often the functional stuff, but it's the experiential stuff um, that really is what's going on underneath that you want to try and get to. Uh, so oh, there's, there's many ways to, you can almost be a bit, uh, legalistic about them about it and ask the same question a number of times but um, um my the the branch of psychology that i know well is called morphology and in that path you dig deeper all the time so you know paul talked about the five whys before it's almost like a psychological version of the five whys because you really want to get to the bottom of what drives people to do or think what they do and um, so I think it's about digging deeper into some of those questions and not just sitting on the surface. So uh, again, you know, I, I could probably waffle on about it for about an hour, but um, but I think using those two things will definitely get you better results um, quickly, Charlena. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, add on to that, Charlena, you could also look into things like uh, open-ended and closed questions. Um, so in interviews, um, open-ended questions, 
sometimes may work better. So that's where you get the, the user or the interviewee uh, to kind of elaborate uh, and then tell their story. Um, and then there's also sometimes when closed questions um, where you actually target a specific area may work better in, in, in an interview as well. Yeah, or you could combine the two. So quite often you want to have sort of fairly closed questions to try and, and do some some sort of statistical analysis on what's required uh, and patterns across different um, customer or user groups. Uh, but that, uh, and that helps in one aspect, but yeah, the, the open-ended questions uh, is where Dan's coming from too, where we sort of start drilling down and the conversation could go in a whole lot of different directions based on those responses to, to sort of open-ended questions. Sorry, I'll, I'm just there. Uh, um, I was going to go through some. Uh, there's a couple of other questions on the um, on the question board, um, so I thought um, we should go through those. So the first one, I think this is in order. The first one is from Chris. Um, you've given us a few human-centered design techniques. Do you have any recommended reading or fa favorite HCCD references? Um, now I'm just going to quickly. Um, turn on a light. It's getting a bit dark here, uh, but I, I've got some things I can show you. Maybe I can put some um, things in the chat as well. Hold on a second. So I'm back. Uh, so yeah, so I I, uh, I should have thought about this question coming up, but um, um, I'll give you a few examples. So one book I really like. It's called Design, Think, Make, Break, Repeat. So I don't know if you guys can see, um, uh, maybe if I stop sharing, that might help. Um, so I have a, if you guys can see, so that's a, a, a book that I like, um, techniques. Um, again, you know, I know this is about, um, is a bit of a BA focus. But I also really like this book as well, which is about experience design directly. Um, and it's, you know, the subtitle is a framework for integrating brand experience and value into design. That's really good. But I think the, um, uh, the favorite reference that I have that I like to come to a lot is um, it's called Innovating for People and it's a handbook of human centered design techniques. Um, so again, I can, I can drop the, the details in the chat, but um, this is probably the best book because it, it focuses, it gives you a really good understanding of different types of uh, techniques and it talks you through um, those techniques and gives you instructions. And there's, a bit, there's like 36 different ones in this book and it's, um, uh, it's, it's a really simple way to do it. And I, I would recommend that if you want to use some of those. I guess the biggest challenge is knowing which ones to use in which situations. Um, and um, but I would definitely go down the trial and error path um, uh, because it's better than using none at all. Um, I've checked, checked the Amazon link to that book in the in the chat if people can see it. Yeah, yeah. So that one is definitely the best if you if you want to start somewhere, um, go with that one. I would suggest. Um, um, I think chat's disabled. Oh, is it? All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. All right, so maybe Charmaine, we we can think of a we can work out a way to share um, that with uh, with folks on the call. Um, the next one, so what non-standard techniques would you use apart from traditional ones? Uh, again, so I I think um, there's no I think there's no right and wrong answer to that, and um, uh, Anastasia and I think um, the, the with those examples that we used in, in the pack, it's about trying to think, you know, I, I, I always think it's about working back from what you're trying to do. So if you need to write requirements and you, you, your feeling is that, um, that, you know, you're gonna go down this path of writing a very long requirements document and no one's gonna read it, which is often the case, you gotta think back, well, how do I produce some sort of requirement uh, that is actually going to be uh, is going to better meet the needs. So uh, again, you know this. You know if if you 
for instance, um, I gave you the GPC example there. They wanted a loyalty program. Well, um, the most important thing for me was to understand what loyal customers in high value segments wanted from a loyalty system. So that's why I, I, I argued in favor of talking to them before writing requirements because it would have been a bit ass about if, uh, if we hadn't have done that. So it's about standing up for what you believe will deliver the best um, requirements outcome. So I, I, I probably haven't answered your question, but I think it's a little bit about trial and error and, um, and uh, thinking about it in that way. So um, is, this, is that helpful, Anastasia? Uh, in, a, in a way, so I was looking for some like, you know, practical tips. Uh, if I've, I've had a little bit of experience with human and the design. And for example, like as an example, uh, we did um, interviews with uh, uh, focus groups and we used prototypes. So we prepared some kind of designs for them and make them choose or amend. Yeah. So that was pretty non-standard for me back then because before you would just gather some like you know requirements from not not from your end users but maybe from your SMEs so that kind of <laughs> examples yeah. that was I was well, asking for yeah well, the, well that's a perfect example so yeah so it's a bit so that would have enabled you to uh, to speak and write with more confidence about what should be in the requirements because if you hadn't have done that, you would have just gone to the product owner and the product owner would have given you a list and you would have just written it down. Whereas if you did yeah, in, this, yeah. in this approach, um, you've got a scenario where you can speak with more confidence and write with more confidence about what people will actually want. You know, and you can, there are lots of other things you can apply to that. So, you know, it's great that you put stories in front of them. You know, the next thing you could have done is thought about, well, if, you know, um, you know, if ask them to assess and prioritize with you, what are the most important things from that experience? Uh, because then you can, you know, you know what often happens, you write these requirements and the solutions get developed. But, um, you know, if you really want the, the most important solutions to be developed, you need to know the priority. So, you know, like, so you could apply like another lens over it, things like that. Yeah, like, like a banking app, for instance, um, you know, a, 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 the organisation might think everybody's life revolves around a banking app and it should have everything you could ever think of and people spend all day on their banking app. But in reality, people using a banking app pretty much want to check their balance, make a payment, uh, pay, pay somebody, uh, transfer funds, etc. They don't, you know, they'd rather use TikTok or, or visit, you know, sit on either Zoom call uh, than, than use a banking app, for instance. So... I think there's different aspects that, that you can drill down on too um, by working with, with the, the end user. Yeah. And yeah, the priorities of things, you know, like even the priority of data, you know, how many data uh, items they, they want to complete, for instance, to do something. Uh, yeah, you might end up with a list of 40 uh, items of data that somebody wants filled in, when in reality, the real need is maybe only a few. So but those sorts of things, I think, come from drilling down more uh, and, and and testing things with prototypes. You know, if you have a prototype with that, you know, you have to fill in 40 fields and give it to somebody, they probably stop after the first five and say too much. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, so that's, that's true. Yeah. That happens a lot. Like you, they, everyone wants to gather all data they can. And then you ask them, how are you going to really use it apart from, I don't know, name and maybe basic parameters. And then they struggle to explain you <laughs> just in case, yeah. just in case we need it, just in case we do some analysis. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, there's, and there's ways to do the analysis without having, uh, you know, 40 fields that you have to think a bit smarter about what's the bare minimum you can gather uh, and what you can derive from that information. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's look through there. There's a few more questions. So this is someone who, who's anonymous. So, while writing user stories, I had incorporated screenshots and process flow diagrams and additional informations. Business came back and said, it's a long document. What information do I have to know to perform UAT? Um, how can I improve <laughs> the user stories document um, so business gets what they emit, they want immediately? So I, I mean, maybe it's two documents. Like I think, um, uh, you know, it sounds like you've, uh, whoever this person is, that you try to be thorough. Uh, but you know you, you probably need to know your 
your um your stakeholders as well as you can to know um you know what they really want um so uh you know i don't know if i can add too much more to that scenario but um if, if you know that you've got a time poor stakeholder um you know where uh, you might need to give them a set of uh, set of step instructions and and be done with it i'm i'm not um sure what else i can add to that scenario and, and that scenario is a prime example where what will end up getting built the the user will come back and say oh, i didn't really want that i want something else uh it, it is really hard uh, yeah, yeah. So, but but I, I i i i totally understand where you'd, you'd you'd want to do that um mm -hmm. but yeah you've 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 probably got to um sort of there's what you want to do and then what you think will be acceptable to your client so um you might have to ju judge the two okay a couple more questions so um have you had experiences that that team has progressed quite far with a selected um sin design but you realize that the root cause was not really addressed uh, from user experience in those situations how could you we gracefully influence the stakeholders to come back to the requirements could you give us some suggestions on the way ways that worked well or you think it would work well i could take that but do you want to do you want to have a crack at that one paul uh yeah it's cut um it gets back to sort of um similar to the the Delp story um this organization wanted something uh to to assess risks and issues out in the field so they went through the whole process uh developed it uh uh had lots of fields for the, the users to fill in uh realized that most of the most of the information they were getting back was junk because of, of people were putting the, the first thing that came into their head rather than the, the real answer just to fill in the form yeah. uh then they realized that their whole risk framework uh wasn't correct either so it, it was a, a, a restart effectively of the whole um design yeah. uh and it's really hard i think you, you almost need to to is that sort of research analysis up front to go away and actually work out you know what the risk and issue framework should be um uh, and, and suggest that to the um to the organization or, or the stakeholders first and then work from there so in other words make sure you, you're working to the right framework and then work out the best way to provide that information with the minimal impact to the, the users because otherwise uh, you'll just get junk in a system yeah I don't, I don't know emma if there's a if there is a grace you know like a, a a completely graceful way but i think you just want to draw attention to it and you know like maybe there's ways you can soften it like uh you know say that uh you know that what's um you know what's been designed will will um solve you know 30 percent of the the mm -hmm. user's problem um and uh you know rather than 100 percent, so you can sort of uh, gate you know like um set their expectations but then suggest ways to bridge the gap between them and um, there's ne there's never an easy way to tell the, the, the <laughs> yeah. client that their the solution is wrong or what, what or what they think the solution is is, is not right mm. especially yeah, if really... they're actually under time pressure quite a lot yeah, yeah. and some, sometimes they, they build to the highest value customer which mm -hmm. might be a very small group and alienate sort of um the rest of the customer base that that um probably use it more often uh yeah. so there's those or they tell you or they tell you to design it for this group and then suddenly they change the scope and they want to include all the groups you know like yeah, uh, exactly there's, 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 there's always <laughs> you know like there's yeah. there's you know so I, I think um you know trying to delicately point out that um the the path that is taken or will be taken is only going to solve a percentage of what they want um, yeah you know, it's, it's probably the the easiest way to do it um gareth so let me just see what you've got here gareth from a ba's perspective are the main changes just to the elicitation techniques available to use and not the requirements documents well i mean i can give you my perspective um on that and um i'm happy for paul to uh, give a different one or contradict me i i think the to me the requirements document is, st is still the requirements document like I, I wouldn't be wanting to compromise that um 
I always think about it more about you as a BA, you want that to be the best it can be. So I always think the, the way to make it the best it can be is to ensure that what ends up in it is the best. So that's why um, in the examples I gave you and, and the way I often think about it is, I, you know, I really want to narrow it down to uh, the right thing and not spend lots of time writing requirements for elements of a system I know will never be used by a user or value by a user. Um, so that's the way I would view it. Um, uh, Paul, have you got a different perspective for Gareth? Yeah, I, th I think it also depends on the type of um, uh, sort, you know, what, what you're working on too. So you know, there'll be times where you know, uh, you know, sort of this sort of technique won't work. So things like back-end you know, back systems where you're doing some sort of integration work where it's just changing data items or migrating from, say, Mulesoft to AWS or something like that then you know, a lot of these sort of analysis techniques disappear because they, uh, they're not really relevant. So it's really a case of picking and choosing the tools for the, for the, for the job at hand. But I think the more time, you know, especially for websites, applications, those sorts of things, or migrating you know, transformation type projects, uh, a more uh, iterative, um, holistic you know, analysis user testing type approach is a better way to go. Yeah. Pick uh, tools from the and, menu. Forgive yourself if you get them wrong. You yeah. Because you, you don't right. always get it right. But um but but you still need requirements documents for traceability points of view for for driving testing uh that and those sorts of things. So uh they're not going to go away anytime soon, I don't think. Uh but yeah with, with yeah, the requirements documents or user stories, you can have links to prototypes, for instance, say, you know, re refer to, to, to this part of the prototype uh, for, for interactions or whatever, uh, rather than having to document each of those in turn. So there's, there's ways that combine requirements with visual work as well, a bit like um, I think it was Chris before. Okay. Is uh, Charmaine? Um, are you there, Charmaine? Yes. Okay, so, I um, will share. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, is there a way we can um, get those links to people? Absolutely. So, I was going to grab those resources from you afterwards and just pop them at the end of the slides, and we'll post them out or we'll send them out by email along with the recording sessions. Yeah. yeah. Great. Cool. Um, anything else? I'll just share my screen again. Oh, actually, there is another question in here as well. Okay. Okay. From Serafina, do you have any tips on avoiding getting into or getting to into the weeds with requirements? I. Again, you know, I, my view is you always refer back to the users uh, or customers in terms. Of, um, so I, I think that that's the way that's the way I, I try and keep myself honest. And uh, rather than going into, um, you know, wormholes with product owners and and uh, people that are never going to use something. That would be my advice. Paul, you probably have a, a more detailed uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think it gets back to sort of what's what's the end result that people are after, uh, and keeping that in mind. And then, does that going down to the weeds help that or hinder that? If it doesn't help it, then uh, I sort of stop looking at that weed and go into the next weed, maybe. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it it you can get sort of sucked down into this vortex. Um, and it is hard, but you just have to remember the, the end game and what it's all about. Otherwise, yeah, scope will blow out, costs will blow out, uh, and people like product owner and project manager, etc., uh, will be a, a bit upset. So, yeah, uh, I, th I, th I think some things on the backlog as well to, to look at for you know down the track, but yeah, just keep in mind what what the main pain points are that you're trying to solve. Yeah, I think it sounds track. like a that sounds like another another talk, uh, Charmaine. But it, I think the the you know like a lot of 
clients will blur the lines between requirements and solutions and they'll take you down all sorts of rabbit holes with them uh, so where uh, i you know um it's just you know to try and challenge yourself to not be dragged there with them i think is what i would what i would it is, and, it, and it is very easy to get sucked down that, that way as well so yeah it's just yeah. something you, you just need to keep in mind so, yeah stand up for yourself yeah all right, Charmaine. Okay, I'll share my screen again. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Yep, beautiful, thank you. Uh, now I'd just like to let everyone know just about our future upcoming events that we have uh, over the next month or so. So we do have another webinar running in the next two weeks or in two weeks today with Maria Montgomery. Uh, and the topic is, I don't care about your business requirements. It'd be really great to see everybody there. That was the one we just did. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the topic is the art of getting business analysis right. <laughs> Thanks for picking that up. Yeah, but okay. that is on the 12th of October, and that is with Maria Montgomery. Yeah, actually, that if you go back to the previous slide, uh, yeah. yeah, that lean coffee catch up. That's another good technique for getting information from uh, stakeholders as well. Um, uh, I've used that in the past as a, a di different way of uh, approaching things as well. So, I've used lean pizza as well. So lean pizza, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but yeah, it, that works too. <laughs> 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 it kind of tricks them into giving you information uh, over coffee and pizza. I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they get to drive what the topics as well, which is good. So um, but you get more yeah. that way as well. But yeah, so yeah. If people attend that one. I'd, yeah, or, or have a look at that technique. It's really handy. Now, uh, the IABA is a volunteer run organisation and we are always looking for more hands on deck. Uh, so if it is something that you are interested in, then register your interest online and join our team. Well, that's really all we had time for today. Does anybody else have any other questions or is there anything else that you guys wanted to, to chat oh, yeah, about before we wrap up? Somebody's got their hand up. Um... Is it me, Paul? Yeah. I don't know. Hi, yeah, Kosti. Thanks for <laughs> yeah picking up. So yeah, I just had a question on business requirements. I'm uh, doing one of the projects uh, for a company. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we we are doing it's an agile project, you know, backlog refinement and all the sessions are going on. So now mm -hmm. me as a business analyst, I have business requirements strong, and my business requirements are clear from stakeholders. And when I do uh, engineering refinement sessions with engineers they there are some things you know that can't be uh, you know implemented right you know when it comes to long term projects one to two mm -hmm. years and they do come with question this is not possible like how so i'm in that situation <laughs> or you know anyone can be in that situation where sometimes you have to challenge those business requirements right so how yeah. how do we do it yeah so, so, so what what I've done in the past is had the uh, the the business owners and the engineers and yourself in the same room to work out, you know, what 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 can change, what, what the bare minimum is, uh, are, are there other options for solving the same problem, uh, and and getting agreement that way, uh, because yeah, so, sometimes you know somebody will see something uh, in a different app with different software stack. That, that might work, but uh, you're quite often limited in what you can do. So you need to go back to the stakeholders and and walk through the issues. Uh, and and then I find the devs and testers in the same room at the same time is handy because they may that they get to understand the problem a bit more and they may have other options that they can think about uh, using to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Like because when engineering team, you know, they uh, comes up with a point, it's more of uh, estimates, cost project and all. And then we have to convey again to, you know, business stakeholder, hey, this is how it's gonna 
Yeah. Really? So even before even before you get to estimates stage, you really need to get the the two groups together to come up with potentially a compromise or or tweaks to the stories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then it can go through to estimation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. Great, but there's no other questions that I can see in the chat or the Q&A. So I, I will definitely grab those resources from you guys again shortly after this and we'll compile the slide pack and send it off to all the attendees over the next couple of days. The email address, everybody, just to let you know, will be the, uh, the one that you registered uh, for the rep webinar on Eventbrite. Uh, if you do need me to send it through to another email address, feel free to uh, pop it in the chat before, you, before we do close up. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks so much, Paul thanks. and Dan. Um, that was such an interesting session just with some, you know, some really great solution examples and techniques that you guys use. So thanks so much for sharing. And I'm sure that everyone will be rushing onto Amazon now to be able to get those books. So hopefully no one misses out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I should have ordered one before. And I should tell everyone, I don't, I don't normally sit at home in a tie. I just came back from the office. So um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I, was, guys. I was going to put my tax on, but I couldn't find it. So. Uh, <laughs> maybe next time, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just before Thanks. we do finish up, everybody is eligible for a CDU for your for your attendance tonight. Uh, so just please keep your uh, thank you for attending this webinar email and your records as proof that you attended. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the session. Yeah, th thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks, thanks guys. All right, Bye. see you next time. Bye-bye.